Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ken Elkins. I'm the Community Conservation Manager for Audubon, Connecticut, and I'm happy to be sharing with you today about using our phones for identifying birds and butterflies and other parts of nature. Many people have contributed to our uh, conversation in the chat box already, uh, and that is a great way to start our conversation with so many people joining us today. We're going to ask that you stay muted throughout and we will have uh, breaks for question and answer throughout. And if you place them there, then our staff will be able to read them for us as well. Today I'm going to focus a lot on bird identification apps. There's a lot of them out there. Some are free, some there is a fee, but I'll explain the value of those. Uh, and why I choose to use them. Uh, there are a lot of questions about apps for bird sounds. How to identify birds by sound? And I will go through how to use those, uh, which ones there are, and the pros and cons of each of them. So there's already one question for those in the chat box. Also, what's really important uh, for many people is recording the birds that are there uh, so that they have their life list. And also, if you're not concerned about the list yourself, there are plenty of researchers that can use even the backyard birds that you're recording at your feeder every day can help a lot uh, of scientists and conservation staff with where birds have been uh, trending to move, what their distributions are, and how they're being affected by things like climate change or even just certain weather patterns. So we're gonna spend a little extra time on that too. And then many people are here today because they're interested in things like butterflies and flowers. And my specialty is birds, so I need some help at times identifying them. And that's where there are some apps that can help us along the way with that. So, uh, my plan is to only share for just over half an hour today and leave time for question and answer and then also walking through how to use that eBird app in more detail is something that a lot of people have uh, asked for help with. Today, since we are a large group, most of you have been able to find your way to the chat box, your strip with the mute and stop video buttons. Uh, there's also a more dot 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 and the chat is sometimes hidden in there if you don't have a chat button. Once there, you can please keep the conversation going with everyone else. Some people are actually replying to each other through this area. If you're an introvert like I am, uh, you may choose instead to send the message privately to Kate Pratt. She's my colleague at the Audubon Center, Bent to the River, and she is going to uh, help read the questions for us. And if you have any technical issues, like you can't hear me very well or something like that, uh, she can certainly help you out with that. That She's been side by side with me through most of our uh, Zoom workshops over the past three months. So who is this guy sharing with you on the screen today? Uh, I have been the Community Conservation Manager for Audubon, Connecticut for about a year now, but I've been with National Audubon for 12 years. Before that, I worked for the Independent Connecticut Audubon Society and I have a degree in environmental biology. I've been a birdie watching tour guide and uh, most of my career has been in teaching school groups and adult groups and leading lots of different areas, summer camps of uh, exploring nature. And one area I've found that is great is I carry around so many different books is now that our phones can carry those books for us. And, Actually, they're getting a little bit smarter than us in some ways now that there's some great ways they're being trained. There are lots of different bird identification guides out there. And some of those that we're going to cover today are Merlin and the Audubon Bird Guide app. Uh, in your, uh, when you registered, there was the link there that there's a list of all of those. So you can go back to that page. Uh, we will hopefully put that in when we send you the recording, we'll send that list. Not just because I work for National Audubon, I do actually prefer the Audubon Guide app. It has some interesting features besides being just a field guide and all of these apps now have multiple ways of helping you out in your bird watching. Uh, one thing they can do is act just like a bird field guide with photos and illustrations. Uh, and the basic information of their range maps, 
Also, by being in your phone or tablet, there's the bonus that the sounds are now included with it. So you get both the visual and help with the sound identification in one spot. Another thing that the Audubon Bird Guide has now is finding birds with eBird. And you can also even make that a recurring uh, function that it will actually, you can list birds that you would like to find and it will tell you when somebody else has reported them within a 5, 10, or 20 mile radius that you choose. When you first open up the Audubon guide, you can also see that you can record your own sightings there if you're not comfortable enough with eBird because it's multiple steps. You can even use the Audubon guide to keep your list. You can set up those alerts for when other people have found an interesting bird that you would like to find near you. Uh, you can also add your own photos of the birds if that's something you would like to do. And there is also a function of uh, within the field guide for helping you through the steps of how to identify the birds. If you would like that alert set up, you can use that custom list button and when you start to open it up, you'll be able to make your nickname for your list. And then add the birds that you want to see. So for example, this spring, I was doing a birdathon that we wanted to try and find as many birds as possible in one day. And people had sponsored us per bird species to raise money for Audubon in Connecticut. And there are some birds that are just more difficult or I had not found out where they might be yet this spring. So I made my own list of birds during spring migration that it would give me an alert the day before my birdathon of where they've been recently seen so I could have a better map of where I should be going to find the different birds. Uh, so it can help you plan out where you're gonna go bird watching next. Uh, and it will also sometimes help you with just getting to know where birds are in your own neighborhood better by setting that up. The next app I wanted to share is the Sibley guide to birds as an app and this app is does have a fee it is about twenty dollars but if you're to buy the book it is thirty dollars to buy the full print book and it is also going to cost you closer to fifty dollars to get all of the recordings that are included in this app uh, so it is really a great resource to have and it uses a little bit more um, resources in it. One thing that it does is that on each species screen there in the middle of the screen right now, you can see that there are extra images, not just the illustrations, but you can look further down and scroll and see the Im immature birds. There are some photos attached as well. You can go to the range map. So it's organized rather than scrolling and scrolling and scrolling for the same bird over and over again. You instead get to uh, see it by that uh, tabs at the top. Then you can quickly get to the sounds of that species. And there's even a tab very quickly of similar species that, well, that looks sort of like the bird, but what are the other options that are close to it near me? that it does take into account where your location is. You can turn that function off if that's something that you don't want it to be able to do. And the smart search function is also wonderful. On the uh, first page, when you first get there, you'll be able to tap on smart search and smart search. And now on the right side of your screen, you can see that there are questions that if you were to call up an Audubon Center or another expert or have a friend helping you with how to identify a bird, these are the questions that we ask and you should be asking in your own head. And I go through these so quickly, I forget what those questions are when I'm identifying a bird. But the first thing I do is ask questions like, what type of bird is it? Is it a heron or is it a woodpecker? Or is it little and brown like a sparrow? What are some key shapes I noticed about it? What habit was it doing a certain behavior? And the color patterns, and it already has taken into account your location if you have that included. So it's narrowed that down from the 800 plus species in the field guide down to maybe that 300 species that are near you possibly through that season.
Another app that goes through multiple steps of helping you identify a bird is the Merlin app from Cornell. And I know a lot of people, especially a lot of intermediate level birders, love this app for double checking their identifications quickly. And for beginners, there's a lot of other great features to it as well. All right, can we hear me now? Yes. That, all right, yes, I hit the mute, so I think I've gotten away with everyone else's uh, microphones again. Sorry about that. Uh, it has illustrations to point out the uh, sizes relatively to help you out that rather than that random question of what group of birds was it in, it gives you a different level of recognizing that. What the main colors are, you can choose more than one color. And We can also then uh, add a photo, believe it or not, in this app to be able to um, help you with identification that this app has in it the photo recognition software that it's been training. I remember over 10 years ago, I was using the eBird website and going to the Merlin section of it and helping them just point out where in the picture was the bird. Uh, and then was it seeing the right side of the bird or the left side of the bird? It took a long time and a lot of volunteers to train the computers to do this work. So it's still learning along the way. But it will give you a tailored list of what the possibilities are of birds that have those color patterns in the location that you're at. It also works just like a regular field guide that you can pull up just a page about any bird and see a photo of it, hear the sound, and learn a little bit about that bird. covered some of the field guide apps. Uh, many of you might have the iBird apps. They're a great resource as well and uh, a great value. There are free ones to try out and they work with a lot of backyard birds in particular. Uh, that one uses a lot of illustrations and actually has got this whole uh, open sourcing of how they work with uh, different artists. It's a great resource to have around as well. I didn't feel like I had enough time to add that one, but are there, have there been any questions, Kate, that we should uh, try and address before we move on? Yes, we have a couple. The first one is from Patsy. She asks, why is Cornell's BirdNet only available for Android? Uh, so BirdNet is one of the apps for recognizing birds by sound. And it is very intriguing that it is set up for Android first rather than iPhone because uh, or iOS, because just about everything else that's come from Cornell has always been on uh, iOS and not on Android first. It has something to do with the way that Android works and the programmer that they have hired for working on BirdNet. Uh, it will eventually be out on uh, iTunes as well. I don't know a date for that yet, but it is a great uh, resource if you can try and use it. You can also record your own recordings on your phone and if you have an iPhone you can then bring it back and use the BirdNet website and load it there because if you are using BirdNet in your phone it is going to use data at that moment because it has to phone home to Cornell to its computer to be able to recognize it. Um, the next message our question is from Liz. Um, she wants to know how do we access the custom lists, lists on the app? That was for the Audubon Birds app and it is, uh, let's see, I had that open just a little while ago. I used it a lot this morning actually. I had a three hour bird survey and I had this app open to point out the bird sounds to the landowner. I was teaching about the birds he had on his property and um, there is under my, on the right hand, the bottom right, there is a my custom bird lists and you can then use the plus on the custom lists for that. Diane asks, now that the leaves are on the trees, she's wondering, uh, she's working on recognition by sound, which app is the best for that? 
Uh, I'm going to go over bird sound apps in just a few minutes. So I'll uh, explain the pros and cons of each of them because I don't know if anyone has a true favorite. It depends on the, the user as to which one they like the best. Christine asks, do Audubon and Cornell apps share data or do we need to enter data in both for completeness? I'm going to recommend that uh, for completeness that you share with the eBird app that I'll describe in a few moments because that goes to Cornell, but then Audubon and Yukon and any of your state wildlife divisions, their staff can actually get access to the Cornell data on a, on a larger scale. So it is the best one to use for that. Christine asks, can you have multiple locations for searching with iBird? Um, the iBird apps, I think you would have to search each one individually. Um, for the Audubon app, you can make the custom lists, uh, each one for a different location. So that way you could have one for your house and then one for grandma's house that you might be visiting or something. Um, or, you know, to your, uh, to the vacation rental that you're going to have. You could have that list set up before you actually get there. Christine asks, which of these apps are easiest to use overall? I know a lot of people who love Merlin and use that one on a regular basis. I use the Audubon app the most because I just have gotten used to where the information I need is and it's that I'm playing the bird sounds from that um, to teach people uh, most often is how I'm using that. Overall, I think more beginning birders would use Merlin, um, but it's a really close second with Audubon. And then I had a few people when I did this program a while back that they absolutely love the iBird brand and love those programs. Um, I have a binocular question. Uh, which are the best binoculars for bird watching? This is from Joan. Yeah, Joan, we're going to put into the uh, chat box in a moment is that there is on audubon.org's website, you go to get outdoors and there is an entire uh, research that Audubon team did of uh, different birders, so different sizes and ages, um, so fitting their hands. They did an entire review of binoculars based on your price range because uh, there are definitely varying degrees of um, how much you can spend on binoculars and then which ones are best within that price range. Liz asks, do you use iBird or find Audubon preferable? I think you answered that, but then she yep. says, I find Merlin to not offer the correct bird more frequently than not. The more that you enter into some of these apps, you might find that out, um, that uh, these are computers in training still. So Merlin will only get better with time when we get to the birding by sound apps. Uh, I am completely comfortable and secure in my job that uh, computers are not going to take over for me on identifying <laughs> birds by sound anytime soon. Uh, but it is useful for many common birds in particular. So it's great questions, everyone. Thanks. Uh, and as you know, keep them coming whenever they, you immediately think of it. Type it in. That will make sure we get to it in the next break in a few moments. So birding by sound. Uh, Song Sloop is now a free app. It was previous to January. It was an app that cost a few dollars. And Song Sleuth and Bird Genie both work almost the same way in function uh, of how you use them, but they both have, they have different computer training of how they recognize the sounds. So, um, keeping both of them on your phone and then trying out the same bird with both apps is sometimes the best success at the moment. BirdNet, I didn't actually put any screenshots up. It is for Android only. That one phones home to Cornell's servers uh, in this function I'm about to show you. And that one has a much better success rate, but that's because it is uh, getting data out of a much bigger computer and not just software that's in your phone for that moment. So what Song Sleuth does is that you open up the app and it is immediately 
uh, using the microphone of your phone and it is watching the sounds, listening for the sounds around you and you tell it when you want to actually record and it knows that you probably wanted that sound that was a second and a half ago before you, your finger could touch and it actually works backwards about a second or so and then records for as long as you wish and it makes a spectrogram it makes a physical representation a drawing of the bird sounds and all the other sounds around it so if there's car noise there's wind in the leaves there's crickets it will hear all of that and you need to see the part of the screen that was when the bird sang and help it crop that picture of the spectrogram down to the part where it is the bird then it will give you likely matches and you can play them and the caveat here is some of you have taken my birding by ear courses here online this spring we know that some birds have an amazing variation so when you hit play on common yellow throat you're hearing just one of its five or six main songs so the one you heard and the reason why it's matching it knows it's common yellow throat but you're hearing it's play two notes rather than three notes that you're used to or what it actually the sound that you heard that time was so um it is something that they're learning and there's so much variation and so much background sound that it's a likely match and not a perfect one then it does include a little bit more about the bird so that way if you just saw a fragment of the bird fly away and into the bushes and then you heard it sing and you recorded it with song sleuth you can then look it up and be able to match up kind of like a field guide as well. So it's got all of those things included in it. So here is a screenshot of the screen right after you've recorded the sound. And you can see those two red blobs there. The brighter it is in red, the louder the sound. And then you can see all the little noise of wind and crickets and stuff behind it. So you would then uh, be able to help it figure out that part of the screen that it should be trying to identify the most. And here's what the likely matches look like and you can play them. You can see a picture of the spectrogram so you can match. It doesn't look like the same pattern. Maybe it's not the same pitch, but the, does the pattern match? <clears throat> and here's the screen for Bird Genie. It has a slightly different look to it and you can start recording it shows the spectrograms in black and white and the darker black it is is the louder the sound so you again crop that picture and this one you can for some people might be easier to be able to see where the song is on that image and then be able to help your phone know where to start to identify one important function of it is to drag that bottom line up. If, even if you leave the length longer than the bird sound, at least try and find the bottom because it's the lower section is the whooshing of the wind past your microphone. It is the tire noise on the roads nearby. You want to block that part out as much as possible and give your phone the best chance of being able to identify that sound for you. And then you can try recropping. You can record another bird and it will keep all of them. And you can leave it unmatched for later. Honestly, most of my recordings in Bird Genie are listed under unmatched, that the software has not caught up and been able to identify the birds I was recording with it on my phone. Um, interesting that Nikki was not able to, Nancy uh, wasn't able to download Bird Genie uh, because I do have it on Android and do use it pretty regularly. So I'm wondering why it wasn't available that day. Maybe it was just down for uh, an update and try again to be able to download it. Um, so Bird Genie does have a fee uh, because it is made by the same people who make the Warbler Guide. So uh, it is, they need some sort of funding to be able to do all this computer work to make something that functions better for us. And uh, it is only a few dollars, um, but it 
I would try Song Sleuth if you like the functionality. Try that one first, because that one they just did make free. If that's something you're concerned with, seeing whether it even works for you to try and do it. Some people don't have the patience or it takes too long to get to the app to then record the bird sound that you're trying to identify. It just might not be something that using an app to do that part of your birding just might not be for you yet. But if it is, then I personally think Bird Genie works a little bit better than Song Sleuth. Um, it still has a long ways to go of recognizing them that I was 10 yards away from a singing winter wren with a big, beautiful, long song. It made an amazing spectrogram for me. I actually use that in some of my other workshops now because it's my own work um, in there. I did have a while where the share button for sending that song that I recorded to my email, it wasn't working. It was crashing my software. So I sent them error messages and it is something that's been fixed now. So they are pretty responsive to that as well. So those are the two bird sound apps. And any quick questions about those before we move on to eBird and then uh, to not birds? Um, Patsy says she, she lives in New Jersey and was surprised to see the song sleuth listed bald eagles, great horned owls as not common there. Um, it is probably set up not just by state, but even by county. Um, so if you're in a very suburban area of the state, then Great horned owls actually are kind of decreasing. Bald eagle is increasing. So um, that is something I don't know how that app decided how to list common and uncommon. And um, eBird is the only app I would be worried about if it's trying to tell you if it's uncommon or rare. The rest of them, that's a, a functionality that it's kind of a, a gray area that they haven't really defined, but eBird is using statistical and it's, it, it's a list that is curated and reviewed every season of which birds should be on that rare list. Patsy would like to know if the fee includes future updates. Yes, I have purchased some of these apps years ago and I'm still getting uh, updates for them. I think Sibley's is the only one that when it went from their, the first field guide to the second, that one was such a big redo of putting a whole new book into the app. That one uh, was one that cost again, um, but I personally have a digital copy and not a print copy of this modern Sibley's is a choice I made. Patsy's also asking, where's the option to se select county? I think it's, uh, if you shared your location, it's figured it out and you, um, so you can't change that. Maybe if you turn off, use my phone location, then you would get to choose the location manually. But I think most of these apps, they all use your um, GPS or even Wi-Fi location um, is how they're figuring out where you are. That's it. Great. So there are a few more detailed apps, and if warblers are a group of small songbirds, and if there's something that you're really interested in, then I highly recommend this app. It costs about $12, and if you have an iPad in particular, or a, even a um, Android, if you have any tablet that you can put it on, this app is gorgeous and brings the whole book, which I still learn more about warbler identification uh, every time I open up this book and every time I open up this app now. So uh, I'm sorry the pictures are pixelated that when I did screenshots, it didn't actually make, it didn't transfer over very well. But one of the most fascinating parts of this is that not only does it have the side by side or actually it's top and bottom of two uh, similar species. So if you have northern water thrush and Louisiana water thrush, two warblers that look nearly identical, you can have them side by, or one above the other on the screen, and you can click on the left-hand side that you would bring down a menu, 
and you can choose whether you're seeing the underside, the tail feathers only, um, or there's also a 3D model of every single warbler species. And what happens then is you can see that American red start there. You can take your fingers on the screen like you were moving a map or anything else and you twist, you can also expand. And as you twist, it moves the bird. So you can then position the bird just at the angle you saw the bird. And you can see which field marks were there are visible from that angle. Because warblers sometimes are way over our heads or they're way down in the bushes. You can get to see the angle that the bird was. And then you can also do comparisons to see whether, well, in that species, there is no yellow, yellow visible when I see it from this angle. So it couldn't have been that bird. Uh, and it is all of the same information that is in the book got put into the app. And they also have another method for teaching warbler song. So they go through all of that in that website as uh, in the app as well. So it is a warbler guide from Princeton University Press. Yes, Nancy, that is the one that I'm referring to there. Uh, and it is exactly that a digital version of the guide. And uh, this is the one that I absolutely loved when it went to Android because it was on iOS for three or four years and I was so jealous of everyone who had it that way first. <clears throat> so uh, it's a great app to sit down and study from. I have not used it in the field for being able to match up, did I see a, a female bay-breasted or a female Cape May warbler? I have not tried that out yet. Maybe in October I will need that function. Uh, but doing it from studying at home is really, really valuable. Or, you know, while I'm in a waiting room, it's with me and it's not on my bookshelf back at home. It's right there in my pocket when I've got a few free minutes. Now on to eBird. And eBird is a larger than just an app. Uh, eBird is a massive database curated by Cornell Lab of Ornithology. It actually started years ago after Cornell and Audubon created the Great Backyard Bird Count, was the first ever bird count where everyone entered their information online and we could see instant results of what everybody else was seeing. After a year or two of that working well, they created eBird just for North America. And now it is worldwide and it is functionally there for you to keep your list for you. And the app is a great way, rather than have to carry paper and write down the birds, it can count for you. And it keeps track of how long you were out and it can even track how far you walked. Uh, because those are th all pieces of information that if you went to ebird.org, the website, and tried to submit your information, it would ask for. And I'm horrible at realizing, did I walk a half mile or a mile? I just know I was out for an hour. So I have to estimate that or use some other mapping software to figure out how far I walk. But now in the app, it keeps track of that for you. Uh, and I haven't had a checklist this morning. We walked uh, most of a 160 acre piece of property in the forest and we ended up with about a two and a quarter mile long walk uh, zigging and zagging through the forest. And every time I found an oven bird, I just had to tap on the name oven bird and it, or on the number and it just added another one for me. And I could just tap three times if there was a family of white breasted nut hatches. You can use the, uh, to quickly get from bird to bird, there's this species name or code up in the corner. You can just start to type in a name. And so H-A-W, and it will start to give you all the hawks that should be near you. And also gives you Harry Woodpecker because the banding code is H-A-W-O. It can use shortcuts to get you to the species that you wanna write down as quickly as possible. If you uh, also long um, go through this in a little bit more later on, but you can also long press on it and you can put in even more details of whether it was a male or a female or a young. Did you notice them carrying nesting material? You can put in all sorts of notes. You can also attach images and sounds you recorded from your phone right into this checklist. When you're done with your list, you can then double check its location 
uh, and you can tell it whether it was an incidental report, it was at a traveling, uh, you walked a distance or drove a distance while birding, or did you stay in one location like it was your backyard and you didn't move more than 15 feet to notice every bird because you were just sitting on your back patio? Um, it's all there. An important question it will ask you, and what's great about this software in the phone or online is that if you miss something, it catches it and asks you again. So it will ask you, did you identify all the birds you found? And there are days that I'm not paying attention and there were gulls, but I didn't identify which species. So I would click no. I didn't identify everything that was out there on the beach. Then you can review your list, oops. And then it also keeps for you your entire life list. That's not my life list, I wish. Um, but this was a screenshot from someone else to be able to share and you can get to see lots of other information about your bird watching. Once you've entered that stuff into eBird, it turns back into the Audubon app where you can have those alerts set up or for people who travel for bird watching more, uh, we use the Bird's Eye app. And that app makes a map for you on your screen using all the recent eBird sightings. It also has these wonderful bar charts of how likely that bird is to be found in your area that time of year. Um, it, you can set up how far away to search and you can even have it for rare bird alerts that end up in eBird. It will then give you a notification in your phone if that's something you really want to keep track of. <clears throat> the bar charts are a wonderful way to learn how often or what time of year should you expect to get to see that bird. Um, that people always are surprised that they, um, with, there's such patterns to the birds, it's an easier way to find when they're going to be here or how when you're on a bird walk, a leader says, you know what I'm expecting to find this week is, is that we're just used to what's going to be found in that third week of April or in this third week of June, that's the week I'm starting to expect to see baby Orioles, baby Robins, baby Blue Jays. I'm more likely to see them now than I would have seen them a month ago. So Bird's Eye may have, uh, I think it's a free app, and then if you want to be able to use it for traveling um, or there's certain packs you can add to it, that's where there are fees involved with it um, to buy in its store um, are involved there. So then if you see here, the greater white-fronted goose is a bird from uh, this February when I did a workshop what had been recently found in Connecticut and I could tap on that list on the left and it immediately made the map for me on the right. And then I could see the blue dot is where I was in Southbury at that time. And you could see the red dots of where greater white fronted geese had been reported in that area at that time. You could then even click on a red dot and it would give you the exact checklist of all the birds somebody saw with that greater white fronted goose and it would give you the exact name of the location. And now it's in Google Maps, so you can even start to see the address of where you need to go. Then you can also look at it from the rare bird alert of what birds are more likely to be, um, what is considered rare. And then there's also needs if you are working on a year list. Many birders can then use this function that it looks at your list for you and then what birds somebody else reported that you don't have yet on your eBird list. And it adds that to the screen for you to find out where to go and add birds easily. So onto the non-birds and actually Seek and iNaturalist have functions for birds as well. Uh, many of you probably are using the app called Seek. It was developed by iNaturalist and it is uh, more instantaneous and quicker in function for many people that it uh, uses photo recognition software and these giant databases at iNaturalist to recognize not only butterflies, but flowers and fungi, even feathers on the ground. So it will use an animal tracks that works with as well. So it works for many, many different ways. 
Um, you just simply take your phone and hold it over the object. It turns on the camera when you turn on seek and you don't even have to push a button. It will start to see little dots on the screen and the more green dots that are across that bar of where it says Monarch there, the more green dots, the more certain it is with the identification. And then you can take an official photo of it and you can, for especially young people like we've used this during summer camp, they can start to get badges because they've collected a photo of a frog and a bug and a flower that they've, they're leveling up by finding more and more different types of organisms. It also is connected to iNaturalist, which is what I prefer to use because my observations can go much further into the future because they're collected for community science. <clears throat> so not only does it take a photo of the flower and you can add multiple photos of that organism. So whether it's a butterfly on the flower or it is the flower itself. And then in that top of the screen there in the middle where the orange arrow is, you can ask it, what did you see? And you'll see the digital suggestions just like you would have seen on that Seek app. But also it took note of the date and time and the GPS coordinates. And you can take notes of whether it was captive or cultivated, so it knows whether it was a natural object or was human, and you still want to know what that plant is in the garden, that's okay. It does help you with that. It just wants to know whether it was naturally occurring there or not. And then you'll see that it was pretty sure it was in the honeysuckles, and you could leave it at just honeysuckle, or you can scroll through the suggestions and find a best match. But if you're not sure, and the software doesn't seem very sure, you just click on honeysuckles or it'll say um, mold fungi or shelf fungi and or it'll say that it was a skipper butterfly. You can click on that and then there are, it's an entire team of volunteers, iNaturalist, that will get an alert that there are unidentified uh, organisms, reports, in their specialty. And when we did this during summer camp, it was within an hour. There were already people responding on the species of moth and butterfly and helping us identify them. It was absolutely incredible. The kids couldn't believe that it was, they were getting such instant responses to some of this. And when they took nice solid photos of the butterflies and entered it into iNaturalist and then a, they identified it and then one of the specialists confirmed it, then it was actually being reported to national databases for butterfly research. And what we don't know about iNaturalist that I find fascinating is who knows what types of scientific questions they'll ask in 10 years or 20 years. And they can look back into all these simple backyard observations or people who are just out for walks for stress relief and they took photos to try and identify and learn what was there. They can then get to um, have this data that it adds to the bigger pot and people will get to ask bigger questions that do tiger swallowtails, a common butterfly here, do they have a different spot pattern in the Northeast than they do in the Great Plains? Who knows? Maybe it is a useful question, but they might actually start to find these other geographic um, things by having them all tagged with where and when um, and what dates the butterflies are emerging, all of this is going to be new data that could help out. So that's why I prefer to take that one extra moment, maybe it takes me 30 more seconds to do an iNaturalist version of it than to just use Seek to get the identification. So when we open up iNaturalist, the app, and we click on the functions up at the top right, one thing you might also want to consider is if you're visiting the same sanctuary all the time, say you're going to the Audubon Center Bench of the River where Kate and I work. You can then go to projects under that um, settings and there you can see that there is a project, a BioBlitz project, just for the sanctuary that is near you. A lot of land trusts have done these and a lot of different nature centers, not just Audubon centers, have these set up. There's also projects that if you are really fascinated with mammals, and you take lots of pictures of tracks or fur on the ground or whatever it might be, there might be a project for you to add your observations. 
and that just helps scientists find that data quicker. They might be able to find it eventually, but it puts it into the right spot. And then on some of these projects, you can see what other people have seen at that sanctuary as well uh, and learn that, oh, I could try and find a question mark butterfly at the banks of the river because somebody else reported it. So the projects can be a great extra addition to have. And it is one more click, but it is just one more click to help somebody else with their scientific research. You can then search for the projects using the magnifying glass, and you can then cho choose the ones you've already joined. There will be featured ones because maybe they're timely that they're looking for stuff just this month, or they are nearby. So they are within your, they're close to you and you, that's how it will help you choose them. There are new projects that if you happen to be on a volunteer group for a different sanctuary, then you could help create a project for your area too. There are plenty of other apps. When I said I had 17 apps in my phone, I counted two weather apps, a river gauge app, and a current tide chart app because I want to know the tides for when I'm watching for shorebirds. There's also a river I know that if it's been raining recently, the level of it is totally different. So am I going to be able to get to the spots to see the kingfisher nest that I want to check out? All those things are apps that I use to help me with my birding. And today while I was birding, I had Google Maps open to make sure I could see where I was going. Um, some people use Google Earth and uh, there are other options. Maybe you have something else that you use while you're always out on nature apps. Add that to our uh, list in the chat box as well. What types of other apps that you use while out in nature? So thank you everyone. Uh, those are the apps I use most often when I'm out in nature. There's also Plant Snap. There are a bunch of other leaf identification apps out there, but iNaturalist does plant leaves and flowers and fungi. We tried to include an app that was most useful and does the most different things. Uh, clearly I didn't cover all 17 apps in my phone and there were others that I talked about today that are in my phone at the moment. So uh, those are all uh, conditions that I needed to decide what could I do in 45 minutes or less. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Please add in any extra questions or comments down below. We will email you the list of um, apps again that you saw them when you registered for this. We'll include that list on the when we send you the recording. Uh, hopefully uh, Zoom is able to do it and send it back to us and then we have to get it on YouTube. So it'll be hopefully tomorrow that we can get to it, but I can't always promise sometimes you, uh, Zoom takes two or three days. So early next week at the latest, we'll be able to send you that uh, follow-up. So appreciate everyone coming out this afternoon. It's a gorgeous day and uh, could have been out and about. So uh, I'm glad you took the time to join us today. And uh, thank you. Uh, questions, Kate? Okay, so Christine wants to know if there are any other guides or sites that um, do the 3D view. The Warbler app is the only one at the moment that I know that does it. I did try and find if there's just a um, butterfly app. And I know online there's a whole uh, version of eBird just for reporting butterflies now called uh, eButterfly.org. And you can report just your butterfly sightings, but they haven't converted that to an app as far as I know yet. Um, Liz asked, do you find the app easier than the book to learn from? When I have a large enough screen to put the Warbler app on, because I use that 3D and I also flip, I can flip faster in the app than I can in the guide. But then there's other parts of the guide, like really studying the songs, the spectrograms of them is an extremely bird nerdy thing to do with bird sounds. Um, I like the print version for that. So sometimes I have both next to each other. Liz can't figure out how to access eBird.org or the portion, the portion you were discussing um, from the app itself. She has to toggle between eBird and looking things up on the website. 
Uh, I can show eBird in just a moment because uh, I have that screen actually hiding right behind this caterpillar. Um, okay. That we can do that in just a moment. Are there any other urgent ones that we can cover first? Patsy asks, what do you think of PlantNet? I've not tried that one, I'll be honest. I'll have to look. I've only played with PlantSnap a few times because I just use iNaturalist because it, it, everything's there and I'm a um, Swiss Army knife kind of guy. Patrice wants to know if iNaturalist identifies trees. Oh yes, by bark, leaf, um, it might even be able to use buds in the winter. Let's see. Uh, Bob, thank you for also pointing out that iNaturalist, just like eBird and the Audubon app has a see nearby for birds, you can use iNaturalist to see that certain other notations of the butterfly that you think you're identifying was actually seen nearby, so it can help you confirm that you did see it today. That seems to be it. Great. So I'm going to uh, stop the recording and because we don't need this part.